DW Inside Europe. Hello and welcome. I'm Nick Martin in Germany. On today's programme, France steps up Olympic security after sabotage attacks on the rail network. Paris basks in Olympic glory. Our correspondent at the Games gives us his take on the first week. No pollution concerns for reporter John Lawrenson, who goes for a swim in the Seine. There was a nice family nearby who'd also come here to swim, which was reassuring, and the water was blissfully cool. And away from Paris, Turkey has a street dog problem. Erdogan wants to put them down, but opponents cry foul. Scientific studies have shown that sterilizing animals, especially dogs, reduces not only their numbers, but also attacks on people. Those stories and more coming up on the programme. Once again, our first half this week will be mostly focused on the Olympics. Since the Games in Paris began, France has weathered a raft of security threats, including three acts of vandalism on its high-speed rail network, which have been blamed on far-left extremists. The government has deployed a massive security force, including tens of thousands of police, gendarmes and soldiers. Many troops now on the streets have done stints in places like Afghanistan, Africa and the Middle East. Now they face a very different terrain and mission, as Lisa Bryant reports from the French capital. Troops on a morning patrol in northeastern Paris. Many Parisians have left on summer holiday. Tourists are mostly in more popular locations. But these troops are on alert. Paratrooper Sergeant Jan heads the morning patrol. For security reasons, he can only be identified by his first name and rank. He says the troops must be vigilant in every environment. Whether it's a threat or a problem the population could have, they must intervene. The soldiers are housed in several spots around Paris, including here at Cap Mimoun on the edge of the city, which can house up to 4,500 troops. It's equipped with sleeping, sports and eating facilities, including a cafeteria that serves up more than 2,000 meals. These troops are a long way from missions in Iraq and the Sahel, where some have done duty. Chief Sergeant Charlie served in Gabon, the Central African Republic, Ivory Coast and Mali. The Mali mission was out in the countryside. We had three months of non-stop desert. The goal was to serve in an anti-terrorism campaign in the three frontier region of Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. He and his colleagues are part of Opération Sentinelle, first launched in 2015 after the Paris terrorist attacks. Tout à fait, c'est ma sixième opération Sentinelle. Chief Sergeant Charlie was there. The troops are also under threat today. One soldier survived a stabbing attack earlier this month. The suspect was arrested. They put in marathon days starting at 5 a.m. and ending after midnight. We have to secure um, the place where there are a lot of people, like the um, train station or uh, the, um, the scene of um, the river, the scene, you know, uh, the fan zone. That's Captain Corentin, another one of the paratroopers. He and his fellow soldiers also get questions from visitors, including directions to various locations. I am very proud of to be here for the Games because you know the last time it's about 200 years uh, the Olympic Games take place in Paris, so it's uh, one time in a lifetime. Many people seem happy to have the extra security, like Chantal Istolainen enjoying the morning sun. Bonne idée, bien sûr, oui, oui. Ce sont des troupes qui it's good to have them here. These troops are ensuring our safety. It's super important. Some of the soldiers hope to have time to attend some Olympic events. If not, they'll be catching up with the Games on TV. Lisa Bryant, DW, Paris. 
Now, the opening ceremony for the Paris Olympics was a typically French affair, with organisers opting to hold the spectacle outside a stadium for the first time to show the city's incredible monuments and historic sites. Some viewers thought it lacked the atmosphere of previous opening ceremonies, while others applauded Paris for going out on a limb. There's been all kinds of controversies, like announcing the South Korean athletes as coming from North Korea, and the ongoing saga over whether the Seine River is safe for athletes to swim in. DW's Jonathan Crane is in Paris to report on the Games, and I managed to get hold of him on the phone as he was racing between venues. And I asked him whether the first week had lived up to expectations. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say it's been a success overall. Um, Seven days, I can't believe it. You know, when you start these things and you think, oh, I've got more than two weeks of sport ahead of me. uh, And then all of a sudden you're halfway through in the blink of an eye. It's it's incredible, really. But just in terms of what I've seen with my own eyes, you know, there's not been many empty seats in the arenas I've been to. Paris seems pretty full with Olympic fans. We've been hearing in the run-up to the Olympics, oh, the tourists are going to stay away, the Parisians will leave, it'll be a ghost town. I mean, it really isn't. It's full with people. So in that respect, I think you can say it's been a success. Um, The IOC will also point to things like digital engagement. They're obviously very keen to attract a, a younger audience, and I understand that that's up quite significantly on previous Olympics, so the IOC says. Obviously, there have been... A few teething problems, let's say the opening ceremony probably didn't quite go how they expected because of the weather largely. Also the controversy over that last supper scene. And I suppose the biggest uh, embarrassment so far really for organisers has been the fact that they had to postpone the triathlon event so that they have now taken place. Obviously Paris had made such a big thing of cleaning up the Seine before the Olympics so that people could swim in it. Slightly embarrassing that it didn't go completely to plan, but they did get there in the end. And I know, of course, so many Olympic fans are absolutely glued to every single moment of the Games, but uh, not everybody has the time to follow it religiously. What have been the sporting highlights for you so far? Always tricky to pick just one highlight because, you know, even in a week I've seen quite a few events and there have been lots of highlights. I suppose from a sporting greatness point of view, watching Simone Biles in the gymnastics winning team gold for the United States was really, really impressive, especially given what she went through in Tokyo to come back and perform at such a high level on the international stage really takes some doing. I don't profess to be a gymnastics expert, but just with my amateur eye, she did seem head and shoulders above everyone else in that competition. Some of her performances uh, on the floor routine, for example, all the balance beam, really, really spectacular. I guess from a French point of view, I was at the uh, swimming for Leon Marchand when he won the 400 metres individual medley, a raucous atmosphere inside that swimming arena. The noise really reverberating around. Uh, The French fans shouting allez every time he came up to breathe uh, on the breaststroke leg. So that was a very special atmosphere. And I guess just overall, some of the venues, spectacular locations. You've got the beach volleyball right in front of the Eiffel Tower. You know, the fencing is taking place at Grand Palais, this opulent palace. Uh, And you've got the fencing, a kind of gladiatorial arena that they've set up. And the urban sports are taking place at Place de la Concorde. So Paris really making use of some of its landmarks. And talking of the fencing, Ukraine has won its first medal in the fencing. What sort of welcome have the Ukrainians had in Paris? I think they've had a very positive welcome. Um, Olga Karlan in the fencing, Ukraine's first medalist of these games, was really cheered on by the French crowd. She had to face the French fencer in her semi-final. Lost that one. Obviously, the French crowd uh, was supporting the home fencer for that one. But then when it came to that bronze medal match, Carlan was behind. She was six points behind at, at one point. And the French crowd really, really got behind her, chanting, Olga, Olga. So I think that shows, you know, how Ukrainian athletes are being supported. Uh, Ukraine is also one of many countries that have uh, so-called Olympic houses here in Paris. They basically created a space where fans can come and meet athletes. There's lots of cultural events going on. And the uh, France's sports minister was at the opening of the Ukraine house Uh, So a sign of her support. And Sebastian Coe, the president of World Athletics, was also there underlining his unwavering support for Ukraine. He said that they're firmly behind them. Obviously, athletics is one of the rare sports that has taken a really, really firm stance on Russian athletes. They've been completely banned from competing, not even as neutral. So I think it really does show that Ukraine is being well supported here. And we'll hear more from DW's Jonathan Crane at the Games in just a few minutes, including about how the French Alps have just been awarded the 2030 Winter Olympics. 
As we've been hearing, one of the hopes of the Olympics organisers was to have athletes swim in the Seine River. The French capital spent more than a billion euros on new water treatment facilities. But despite the huge investment, as late as last weekend, the Seine was still not clean enough to swim in. By Tuesday, of course, the triathlon did go ahead on the river, but not before our Paris correspondent John Lawrenson put on his togs and went for a dip. I read in the morning paper that the start of the triathlon had been delayed. The storm rains of the previous night had apparently done what 1.4 billion euros of infrastructure investments were supposed to prevent, flooding the sewage system until it overflowed into the river. Paris had lost its great eco-gamble, failed to make the Seine swimmable in time for the Olympic Games, at least by people who aren't trying to commit suicide. I finished my breakfast and drove off to a place called Mont. Mont, I later read on Wikipedia, is where, after conquering England, the Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, attacked the Kingdom of France and was fatally wounded by his horse. I wasn't going there for that, but to write about the joys of walking the path along the chalk cliffs above the wide meanderings of the Seine. It was a very hot day, the start of a West European heat wave. After walking 10 kilometres or so, I stopped for a beer in a cafe. It was like 32 degrees Celsius or something. As I was leaving, I asked a big bearded local if you could swim here. Of course you can, he said. I swim here every year. And as I trotted off in the direction he recommended, he shouted, slightly weirdly, but then spontaneous humour is a hit and miss affair, think of me and you'll swim faster. A few minutes later, I was wading into the Seine. Try not to think about the bearded bloke or, above all, the fact that Paris is upstream and the above European standard levels of this, that and, let's face it, probably the other, are all washing my way. But frankly, astonishingly perhaps even, it wasn't difficult. The water seemed kind of okay. There was a nice family nearby who'd also come here to swim, which was reassuring, and the water was blissfully cool. I did a bit of breaststroke, that's the one that keeps your mouth at maximum distance from the water. And, as I got into it, went for some serious backstroke, swimming against the current, which was very strong, and ended with a bit of Anne Hidalgo class front crawl. An enormous barge appeared. Its name was Smack, probably Dutch for something, I thought. A nice member of the nice family said we'd better all get out because of the wash, so out I got. Feeling, I must say, like a bit of an Olympian. I had had my sane baptism and I had seen the light. This river was swimmable. It was going to be great. About a half an hour later, I felt a slightly strange soreness inside my chest, like it was burning a bit. Probably nothing to do with it, I thought. And I do feel completely fine now. A couple of days later, the triathlon finally got underway and I'm sure they're all fine too. Well, almost sure. John Lawrence and DW just a little downstream from Paris. Now, social media went into overdrive last Friday evening during the opening ceremony for the Paris Olympics. It was quite the feat to host the spectacle along the River Seine instead of inside the stadium. But not everyone was impressed. I asked DW's Jonathan Crane, who's in Paris, if the ceremony missed something from being staged on the river. I don't think so, actually. I don't think it really missed anything. I mean, these opening ceremonies, they always last quite a long time. It's an opportunity for a host country to show off its culture, show off its history. And and I think, you know, Paris has to be commended for attempting to try something new. And it was something really, really ambitious. Obviously, it required a lot of security reinforcements, lots of threats being made in the run-up to the Games. But you could say they pulled it off. And as I said, the one shame was the weather, because the whole idea of doing it on the Seine, this six-kilometre stretch on the Seine, was to show off Paris in all its beauty. You know, that river runs past some of Paris's most famous landmarks, Notre Dame Cathedral, it goes past the Grand Palais, it goes past Invalide, and then to finish up in front of the Eiffel Tower. The rain obviously then dampened spirits and also dampened, I would say, the you know, the visuals. We were expecting some really spectacular visuals and perhaps with the rain it didn't quite happen. But I think also from an athlete's point of view, often, you know, the athletes will file into a stadium and then they're stood around waiting for all the athletes to come in 
before you had the next part of the show. This was one show running all at the, t- the same time, mixed in together, the athletes on the boat. So I think they appreciated it as well. And although the Games were awarded to Paris, many of the events are being held elsewhere in France. Obviously, the windsurfing was understandable. It was going to be held in the Mediterranean waters of Marseille. But what about the reasoning behind including Lyon, St Etienne, Bordeaux, Nantes? Was this just to spread the love, was it? I think that's part of it, yes. I mean, the, the motto of these Olympics uh, is game is wide open and they wanted to bring the game um, to everyone and, and, and spread it far and wide. Obviously, you know, Tahiti, a spectacular venue as well for the surfing, uh, 10,000 kilometres away. Another side of it is also logistics. I mean, when you have a football tournament and a basketball uh, tournament, you know, a lot of teams taking part, football in particular, it's just not possible to do it in one place. You need those other cities and other stadiums. So that has given an opportunity to spread the love, as you say. And since these uh, sabotage incidents on the high-speed rail network, just on opening day, security has been stepped up even more. Is this quite noticeable as you go between the different venues? And has that caused any issues? It's noticeable that there is a heavy police and often military presence as well, even after the opening ceremony. Um, you know, you can't, especially walking close to the venues, you can't go more than 100 metres without seeing someone with a, a police uniform or a military uniform. Obviously, from a fan point of view, it, I guess it depends on your mentality. Some people might find it reassuring. Other people might be a bit put off. Obviously, what has been scaled back since the opening ceremony is the closures around the River Seine, which were really problematic in terms of getting around, and especially for, for people who aren't necessarily here for the Olympics. I can imagine there were probably some tourists who come to Paris, maybe thinking we can still see Paris. And uh, for a while, some of the major landmarks were shut off. Security remains an issue. Uh, Authorities are quite tight-lipped on the exact measures they're taking, understandably so. But there is still a heavy presence around the city. And before you go, I've got to ask you about the French Alps being awarded the 2030 Winter Olympics. Uh, the award comes with quite a few caveats from the IOC. Can you just explain what they are and why they've been stipulated? Yes. I mean, essentially, the IOC wants financial guarantees. And this is standard for any bid. The IOC has revised the bidding process now. So gone are the days where several host nations would kind of put together a bid book and, and then present it and all compete. Obviously, a very costly process. The IOC is trying to tone that down a bit. So they identify host cities that they work directly with and then gradually refine the bid. But as part of that, obviously, they want financial guarantees from the government that they can pull this off, that they can put on again. It's, it's obviously no small undertaking. It still costs billions to put on these games. So they want those guarantees. At the moment, France, as we know, is in a state of political turmoil after the elections. We're still waiting for a government to be named. So they haven't been able to provide those guarantees. Now, when uh, Emmanuel Macron was addressing the IOC session, uh, when France was announced as the host of the 2030 Winter Olympics, conditionally, he said it wasn't going to be a problem. So we can take Emmanuel Macron's word if we want. But, you know, it, it is just a procedural thing. The IOC wants to make sure that all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed to make sure that they do have financial guarantees. I was talking there to DW's Jonathan Crane at the Paris Olympics and later in the show we'll turn back time to 2012 and ask whether the London Games were really worth the nearly 14 billion euro bill. Coming up next, sterilise or cull? That's the question Turkey's government has been grappling with over its massive street dog problem. Now, DW's website and social media pages have the latest news from across Europe. That's DW.com or DW Europe on socials. I'm Nick Martin in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe. Now to Turkey, where the country's parliament is considering controversial legislation to cull millions of street dogs. That's resulted in nationwide protests against the government's plans. However, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is standing firm, saying the dogs pose an unacceptable health risk. 
From Istanbul, Dorian Jones reports. Protests have been held across Turkey over the law to round up millions of street dogs. Under the legislation, the dogs will be killed after 30 days if an owner is not found for them. Protester Zulal Kalkandelen explains why she's opposed to the legislation. They're planning to round them up into shelters, which we call death camps. There's been a campaign for some time to fuel hatred about these stray animals. We've been living with street dogs for many years, in fact for centuries. But we're getting to the point where all these animals will be erased. The legislation evokes memories of a dark chapter in Istanbul's past. Back in 1910, street dogs were rounded up and left on a nearby island to starve. In Parliament, tensions rose as deputies exchanged insults over the culling legislation, opening another deep divide in an already fractured political landscape. But President Recep Tayyip Erdogan dismisses opponents' concerns. He claims stray animals have become a menace to society, causing traffic accidents and spreading disease. Gerçek şudur. Toplumun çok büyük bir kesimi bu meselenin bir an the last word on this issue, says Erdogan, should come from the poor person who was attacked by a dog, or the mother who lost her daughter to dogs and who carries her daughter's pain in her heart. These are the people we care about. However, activists say there are more humane ways to address concerns over the number of street dogs. Lawyer Elchem Cemre Senjan is one of the protest organizers. Some people are disturbed by these stray animals or too afraid to even touch them. But the solution is not to put the dogs to sleep. Scientific studies have shown that sterilizing animals, especially dogs, reduces not only their numbers but also attacks on people. Veterinarians have pointed out that the cost of euthanizing a dog is many times more expensive than sterilization. But critics suggest politics could be behind the proposed cull. Erdogan's AK party recently suffered a heavy defeat in local elections and the country is grappling with nearly 100% inflation. So is Erdogan trying to consolidate his religious base by calculating that it's mainly people from the secular opposition who are against the street dog legislation? Protester Eyüp Cice Ali is a professor at Istanbul's Nishantashi University. We know our problems in the country. world knows our problems, economic crisis, and we have human rights problems around everywhere. But they want to change the main topics to these animals. We are born with them, we live with them, we grew up with them, and now they want to collect all of them and kill them all. So we are against them. We are here to protect our values, values of respect and dignity for human and animal rights. According to a recent opinion poll, less than 3% support the plan to euthanize street dogs. But 80% believe they should be put in shelters. And the protests are drawing both the secular and religious. Erdogan's war against street dogs could be risky, a sentiment shared by at least one parliamentarian of the president's party, who was quoted anonymously as saying that killing dogs is really a popular move. Dorian Jones, DW, Istanbul. And I'd like to remind you to subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts to hear all the big, interesting stories from across Europe. This is Inside Europe, and I'm Nick Martin in Germany.
This is Inside Europe, and I'm Nick Martin in Germany. In the next half hour, a German man sentenced to death for alleged terrorism in Belarus is pardoned by Lukashenko. Lukashenko's spokesperson immediately responded to this decision to pardon him, saying that Minsk is open to negotiations, implying that the pardon could facilitate discussions with Germany. Italy's new anti-abortion law is accused of imposing shameless curbs on women's rights. After the final bill for the 2012 Olympics came in at some 14 billion euros, Londoners asked whether they got value for money. London 2012 is an example of grossly exaggerating what the Games can actually do and grossly underestimating how much it costs to do those things. To me, that is a high risk and irresponsible dynamic, particularly where I feel like these promises are being intentionally made. And as tourism season hots up in Europe, a city just southwest of Madrid could be a good stop off. Broadcasting from Germany, this is Inside Europe. The foreign ministry in Berlin has spoken of its relief after German national Rico K, who was sentenced to death in Belarus for alleged terrorism, was given a pardon by President Alexander Lukashenko. The 30-year-old, who under the German press code we're naming using only the first initial of his last name, was convicted in a secretive trial in June of breaching six articles of the criminal code. Belarusian state media said K was accused of taking photos of the country's military facilities and of staging an explosion at a railway station on orders from Ukraine's secret service. His case throws up the plight of more than a thousand Belarusians who took part in protest against Lukashenko's disputed 2020 election win, who are now either in jail or in exile. One of those who fled abroad is Hanna Lyubakova, a journalist and non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council think tank. I asked her why the president had overturned the court ruling and how soon Kay might come home. Well, first, we don't know how soon he may return home because usually, according to the Belarusian law, in a case when a person has been pardoned by the ruler of Belarus, usually this case is being commuted to life imprisonment. On the other hand, we know that some negotiations are happening between the Belarusian regime and the German government. So there are several circumstances that probably show us this. First, Rico K did not appeal to the court's ruling, which is surprising given that he was sentenced to death. Second, even before this pardon, propaganda indicated that the regime had proposed a list of options to Germany. And the third, perhaps, implication is that Lukashenko's spokesperson immediately responded to this decision to pardon him, saying that Minsk is open to negotiations concerning Rico K, implying, again, that the pardon could facilitate discussions with Germany. Indeed, there's now talk of some sort of prisoner exchange. Now, K was charged under six different parts of the Belarusian criminal code, including terrorism, espionage and mercenary activity. Specifics about the case only really started coming out when a video of K being paraded on Belarusian TV emerged. He was asking for a presidential pardon. So can you tell us a bit more about what he was alleged to have done? Rika K said that he wanted to join fighters in Ukraine, but he tried to contact many of them and he reached out via Telegram or via some other platforms. One of them responded and that account gave him a testing task to go to Belarus first. While the regime accused Rico K of being connected to the Belarusian Kalinowski regiment in Ukraine, the one that is fighting on the side of, of Ukrainians, the propaganda clip did not prove that connection. And second, the Kalinowski regiment never gave such a task for any potential volunteer who wanted to join it to go to Belarus first. So there are many questions about it and who was behind this account and who actually took to Rico K regarding this task. Then there are some other inconsistencies in the movie. The explosion occurred on a news tracks on this railway station outside Minsk. It did not pose any risk to railway traffic. So if the, the task was to actually disrupt some railway traffic, that was not successful. So why was it organized there? The regime accuses him of acts of terrorism, which 
again, was not proven because this is something that Rico K says. He was not aware of the fact that explosives were in a backpack that he was supposed to put on the tracks. He was also accused of mercenarism, which is, again, something surprising because even if he tried to join the armed forces of Ukraine, but that's an official unit, um, second, there is no war between Belarus and Ukraine, so why would the person be accused of that? So, as you see, there are some inconsistencies and some experts have questions whether he was manipulated by the regime itself. Uh, Now, Belarus is the only country in Europe to maintain the death penalty. The country even extended the court's powers to apply this punishment for high treason and attempted terrorism. But but wasn't this change related to the mass protests that broke out in 2020 after Lukashenko's disputed presidential election win? This change in legislation happened in May 2022 when Lukashenko approved this uh, decision. And the most important change was that the death penalty would not only apply to people who committed terrorism, according to the regime, but also for attempts to carry out acts of terrorism. What does it mean to attempt terrorism? Many human rights defenders and experts had questions about this ambiguity of the charges because it can allow for the prosecution of political dissent under terrorism-related charges. This is something that the regime is doing. They are accusing people of terrorism if they participated in protests. And the second reason, perhaps, for the change of legislation was that we had dozens of examples of Belarusian partisans sabotaging railway tracks, basically trying to stop Russian equipment and Russian troops from moving to Ukraine and attacking Ukraine. And that was perhaps something that laid the grounds for the change of, of the legislation. But of course, the the main reason is to stop political dissent. I was talking there to Belarusian journalist in exile, Hanna Lyubakova, who is also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council think tank. Now, in recent weeks, Italy has found itself embroiled in a contentious debate over a new law that grants access to public reproductive health clinics for anti-abortion groups. Funding will be drawn from Italy's post-pandemic recovery fund, which is financed through EU grants and loans. Women and students have taken to the streets in protest, while Italy's hard-right Prime Minister, Giorgio Meloni, maintains the new measures are within the mandate of the country's abortion law. Yelena Gostoli reports. Forty-five years since Italy legalised abortion in 1978, thousands have taken to the streets in recent months to protest what they see as the slow erosion of that hard-won right. Last April, the government passed a law to allow pro-life anti-abortion groups to provide services in public reproductive health clinics across the country. The aim of such services is, they say, to help women make informed decisions about abortion and financially support new mothers. Critics argue that these services are designed to dissuade women from having abortions. In some cases, these groups have been accused of spreading misinformation about the risks and consequences of terminating a pregnancy. Gynecologist Tulia Todros works in Turin, in the northwestern region of Piemonte. In the last few years, the region has become a sort of testing ground for right-wing policies. In 2020, Piemonte passed a law enabling the regional government to allocate public funds to support anti-abortion groups. So far, 2 million euros have been allocated. Amid the closure of public reproductive health clinics, which is an ongoing issue, and a lack of funds to pay professionals who should be present in these clinics, there's a very serious issue here. That there's money to pay these people to send us their so-called experts, who, in reality, are not experts at all. Italy has a decentralized healthcare system which leaves regional governments in charge. In recent years, right-wing regional administrations have increasingly catered to the demands of the anti-abortion movement. For instance, Piemonte and other regions have refused to comply with national guidelines designed to facilitate non-surgical abortions, banning the abortion pill. Others have introduced mandatory rules for burying a fetus. Along with a high rate of conscientious objectors, the situation has further increased existing barriers to getting an abortion in Italy. According to health authorities, 65% of gynecologists in Italy are objectors who refuse to provide abortions on moral or religious grounds. 
but data collected by an independent research group shows that in 72 hospitals across the country, the number of objectors is between 80 and 100 percent. 75-year-old Carla Quaglino was in her 20s when the law guaranteeing access to abortion was first passed. Today, she chairs Casa delle Donne, women's home in Turin, and she's a well-known figure in the local feminist movement. She explains that, since the law was passed, activists like her have been fighting for its application. In Piemonte, certain barriers have not been effective. Despite issues like conscientious objection, the region has consistently ensured the availability of healthcare providers. However, a notable figure from the previous regional council, Councillor Morone, has initiated efforts to undermine the application of Law 194. Giorgia Meloni, Italy's first female prime minister, has consistently stated that she has no intention of changing the abortion law. However, she and her Brothers of Italy party contend that the 1978 law requires the state to provide women with alternatives to abortion. This law was originally enacted as a compromise to accommodate Italy's significant Catholic population. A key concern at the time was ensuring that practicing gynecologists could continue their work if they chose to object. According to Piemonte's financial report on the first tranche of the money allocated under the new rules, the majority of the 460,000 euros in funds has gone to Movimento per la Vita, Movement for Life, Italy's largest and oldest anti-abortion organization. The organization has more than 350 centers across the country, known as centers to facilitate life. The movement has closed links with US-based nonprofit Heartbeat International, which runs crisis pregnancy centers that are known for spreading misinformation, such as that abortion causes infertility or cancer. Italian activists fear Italy may be going down the same path. Sara Di Sabato, a regional councillor with the Five Star Movement Party, points out that according to the report, part of the funds were spent on a communications campaign. The reports also include stories of women who are taken in by these anti-abortion associations in truly sad situations. Sometimes these are women who've already had five children, right? And so they're convinced to have a sixth. These are women who are often in a state of severe vulnerability due to family issues, women who've been abandoned, low-income individuals, and so on. Most of these women are foreigners. For Carla Quaglino, it's important to get across to the younger generations that no right, once gained, can ever be taken for granted. I'm 75 years old, so I was in my 20s when Law 194 was passed. When it was enacted, we immediately had to start defending it, even through a referendum. We all remember that. This law is not perfect, and many parts of it were compromises we had to accept to get it passed. Now those compromises are starting to explode. This is the issue. It's not that people forget. No, they just start to see it as normal. They fail to recognize the danger they're actually in. The people taken to the streets, both familiar and new faces, along with the recent push in the European Parliament to enshrine abortion rights in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, demonstrate that this debate is far from over. Ilenia Gossoli, DW. Now, if you have any feedback on any of our reports or interviews, you can drop us a line inside Europe at dw.com and we'll be back in touch with you. This is Inside Europe and I'm Nick Martin in Germany. Paris has received both 
praise and criticism for hosting the first ever Olympics opening ceremony outside a stadium. Some observers have compared the spectacle last Friday evening to London's Games in 2012, which even saw a cameo by the country's late Queen. Staging the mega event always leads to questions about costs and benefits. The London Olympics cost British taxpayers around 13.7 billion euros at today's exchange rate. Our reporter Ben Batker took a look around the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London to see if the city did receive an Olympic dividend. Uh, the two weeks of the Olympics and then the two weeks of the Paras, London just transformed. People spoke to each other for the first time and we were uh, a slightly happier nation. We just had a great summer in 2012. Mark Robinson from the London Legacy Development Corporation, LLDC for short, gives a tour of Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, the main site for the 30th Modern Olympic Games. The 560-acre area in northeast London is at the heart of the redevelopment of the municipality of Stratford. 20 years ago, the area was a mixture of railroads, marshland, gas works, a few residential buildings, food processing companies, and the so-called Fridge Mountain, a meter-high pile of discarded white goods. When London won the bid for the Olympic Games in 2005, the organizing committee promised, quote, to revitalize the area for the immediate benefit of all residents. The government also pledged to make the UK one of the world's leading sporting nations with one million more adults playing sport regularly. To, like, the youth centre there, so that's how I, I sort of blanked <laughs> down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A year before the Games, then 15-year-old James Kaguma moved into one of Stratford's coveted council apartments with his mother. Today, the 27-year-old is, among other things, chairman of the Olympic Park Youth Board. Kaguma says many local residents have benefited from the Games' investments, just like himself. Being able to go to the Paralympics and also have um, the Olympic Park just walking distance, it definitely made my life better. After the Games, we've been able to swim at the same pool that, that Olympic swimmers swam, so it's nice feeling uh, to experience that. Having the Games there, it provided a ripple effect. The London Aquatic Centre, the former Olympic Stadium, now home to Premier League club West Ham United, the Copper Box Arena, the Velodrome and the Hockey and Tennis Centre are the five newly built sports facilities that still stand on the Olympic Park today. Together, their construction cost more than a billion pounds, not including the costly renovations and the annual losses. Spencer Harris has been researching the impact of the Olympic Games for over 15 years. When assessing the sporting legacy of London 2012, he differentiates between elite sport, grassroots sports and school sport, as well as the social impact. According to the University of Colorado researcher, the areas most likely to have been positively affected are elite sport and Britain's medal tally. The decision to invest Emily in elite sport development was taken long before the decision to even bid to host London 2012 at around 250 million per year. Therefore, what we saw at London 2012 in terms of podium success, Rio 2016, Tokyo in 2020, is largely a consequence of that funding. Now, did London 2012 give it an extra boost? Probably. But is that worth £10 billion pounds worth of investment? Harris sees similar trends in para sports. Although the Paralympic Games had a positive effect due to the two-week media omnipresence of wheelchair basketball, goalball and para-athletics, they primarily acted as an acceleration of an already noticeable trend. The sports policy analyst's assessment of school and popular sport is consistently negative. The plan to make the nation fitter as a whole has failed miserably. I think we have predicted to show that there was very little positive impact on the sports side of things, and if anything, maybe some negative impacts. While the participation of 5- to 11-year-olds in school sports stagnated, there was even a slight decline among 11- to 16-year-olds. This is despite the fact that £1.1 billion were invested in various programs between 2008 and 2015. The situation is even worse for club sports and the 16-plus age group. The vast majority of associations recorded a significant decline in participation and membership numbers. In addition, contrary to hopes, the obesity rate in the population increased slightly between 2012 and 2021. However, Harris concedes that the promotion of sport in the UK could at least have slowed down the negative trend in school and club sport. Moreover, London is no exception. According to Harris' own study, none of the seven Olympic and Paralympic Games from 1996 to 2020, with the disputable exception of Beijing, increased participation in sport in the long term. We lit the flame and we lit up the world.
At least as far as London 2012 is concerned, Harris nevertheless believes that properly invested sports promotion could have made a difference. Too little of the total of £2.7 billion in the post-Olympic period had reached the grassroots, though. Rather than investing in institutions and national-level organizations like the Football Association or British Cycling, that money really needed to find its way directly down to civic society and voluntary associations that make a difference on the street. So find a way to get the investment out to local community groups would be my advice for Paris. This leaves the question of the social impact. Over the years, the failure to meet social housing targets has been repeatedly criticized. There is also the accusation that commercial interests were placed above the needs of local residents. For example, many apartments built on the Olympic site were sold at high market prices, making them unaffordable for the majority of residents. Rosanna Laws, colleague of Mark Robinson at the LLDC, emphasizes that the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park directly benefits local residents through the major sporting events as well as a new cultural and office quarter. We've got more than a thousand elite sporting events on the park since 2014. And East Bank will bring the BBC, Victoria and Albert Museum, two universities, and that will return over one and a half billion pounds into London and into the local economy. In the longer term, we'll have created about 125,000 additional jobs in the surrounding boroughs. Despite these positive developments, the opportunity costs of the billions invested must be considered, according to Olympics expert Harris. To him, the bottom line is that it would have made more sense to invest the public money in education, the chronically underfunded National Health Service, or other community-based initiatives. London 2012 is an example of grossly exaggerating what the Games can actually do and grossly underestimating how much it costs to do those things. To me, that is a high-risk and irresponsible dynamic particularly where I feel like these promises are being intentionally made. We are strategically misrepresenting the public so that we get support for what we want to do. London 2012 costs close to $15 billion to host. That doesn't represent good value for money. Overall, the legacy of the London Games is therefore imperfect at best. Nevertheless, London Mayor Sadiq Khan announced in April he wants to bring the Olympics back to London in 2040. It remains to be seen what promises the government will make next time to convince the public and what future Olympics can actually achieve in the face of the sobering findings about the costs and the sporting legacy. Ben Bartke, DW, London. From Bonn, Germany, you're listening to Inside Europe. Finally this week, if you're heading to Spain for your holidays, you might want to consider the city of Toledo. Just a hundred kilometers outside the capital of Madrid, Toledo is a UNESCO heritage site due to its vast historical importance. It was a major city during Muslim rule in Spain, but also a former Spanish capital. Toledo has also contributed significantly to art and literature. It was where the Greek artist famously known as El Greco lived for most of his life and painted his masterpieces. The city was also the literary inspiration for the writer Miguel Cervantes when he wrote Don Quixote. Inside Europe's Ashi Sharma tells us why it should be high up on your list of places to see. Well, I've just arrived in Toledo and this is one of my favourite parts because the station is actually just outside the main walled city centre where all the historical buildings are. And the walk up takes in this breathtaking sight that await you. As I wander up, I can see the famous Alcantara Bridge. This is a Roman-built bridge and it was the only access into Toledo. On the other side, the world-famous Roman fortress called El Cathar, built by the Romans and then rebuilt periodically by Spanish kings. It's perched on the highest point of the city and faces the bridge on the other side. It's no wonder that this is a UNESCO heritage site. Right, well, I've just arrived now in pretty much the, the, the central square, I suppose, of uh, Toledo. It's Plaza Zocodova. My pronunciation isn't the best, but I've got with me an expert, Daniel Holler, who's uh, one of the city tour guides. Daniel, nice to meet you. Good morning, nice to meet you too. Yes. Welcome to my hometown Toledo, welcome to my city, and welcome to the old primitive capital of Spain. It was uh, born during the Roman period. The meeting point here, the beginning for all groves, the meeting point for locals and for visitors, is Zoco de Vier Square. Zoco? Which is where so we are now, isn't it? This is where we are, that is the main Arabic square, the main, you know, trading, selling animals square where the Muslims started to trade, sell animals. 
back in the year 711 when they, when they roll in the city. We are next to the Alcazar, one of the, the main uh, buildings, the emblematic buildings from Toledo, the Alcazar from Toledo, that is the, the palace, the fortress, the old royal palace when Toledo was the capital of Spain. Nowadays, remember, National Army Museum and the main library of the region of Castilla-La Mancha, remember, Don Quixote de La Mancha. Cervantes came many times to Toledo finding inspiration to write Don Quixote de La Mancha because the wife from Cervantes, she was from Toledo. We are a very small city compared to, other men, to many other cities in Spain. We are a city with only 85,000 inhabitants. How many people visit Toledo in a year, would you say? Like near three million. The city hall is making a good job trying to let the controlling the Airbnbs, controlling the hotels, controlling the traffic here, only just the local residents, they are free allowed to drive in, but they have some, the, the rest of the people, they have many limitations. I suppose it really lives for tourism then, doesn't it? All the, we, uh, the industry, I mean, I'm, we're just looking around, all these shops are selling souvenirs, uh, a lot of swords and shields and axes. 55% depend on tourism. We produce steel, we produce uh, wood, crafts, and uh, but most of the economy is based on tourism, yeah. from the guides, but it's 100% touristic, taxi drivers, restaurants, hotels, and, and everything. One of the secret beautiful aspects of Toledo is the artwork of El Greco. And, and, and I think he's probably one of the reasons why Toledo has exploded so much in tourism. Yeah, that is totally right. You know, there's a one year that we can say that is the year when everything changed. In the year 2014, nobody expected there was such a big boom of tourism. It was the 400 years anniversary of the death of El Greco in Toledo, the city where he lived for 37 years until he died. And the best Greco collection, we have it in the inside the cathedral, in the sacristy of the cathedral. They made a nice exposition of Grecos. It started to be popular. Everybody wanted to come to Toledo. It was on newspaper, it was on TV, it was on F1 in the races, it was in the soccer games, it was everywhere. This uh, little boom made the city explode. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, if you come to Madrid, get ready for one day or, or prepare one day, save the day for one day Toledo. Very kindly to American tourists. Yes, from Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, wonderful. Yes. Have, uh, well, have joined me just to give them, give me their thoughts. Uh, so tell me, what brings you to Toledo? We've been to Madrid before and we've heard that Toledo is just a beautiful UNESCO site, very unique, very historical, something not to be missed. And it is, it's very charming. You feel like you're being thrown back in time. Mm. We just took a tour of this cathedral. It's absolutely stunning and breathtaking inside. So we're here just for a little day trip. Yeah, she's more of the <laughs> tour guide. She's looked everything up and figured everything out. I'm just kind of here to help navigate. We came here around 23 years ago and wanted to see if things have changed. And so, have they? Yeah. <laughs> Not really. It's actually still quite a lot uh, similar to uh, how it was back then. It's just a lot busier. It's just a lot busier and different types of uh, you know cafes and places to eat. That's about it. But otherwise, it's still as beautiful as ever inside the cathedral. And going by my tour guide Daniel's advice, there are only two places that I really want to visit now. One, of course, is the El Greco. Uh, museum and to see all his artwork, but the other one is to have a little wander around the Jewish quarter, which he also recommended. This is Ashi Sharma, DW, Toledo. Now, a reminder that Inside Europe is one of several podcasts produced by DW. You can check out our other audio content, including the environmental podcast, Living Planet, and the culture podcast, Don't Drink the Milk, wherever you get your podcasts. Meanwhile, I'm very happy to say that Inside Europe is gaining more listeners than ever before. So thanks for helping us to spread the word. You can hit the subscribe button and give us a review as it will help promote the show to other listeners. This programme was produced by Helen C and sound engineer Jürgen Kuhn. And I'm Nick Martin. Thanks for listening. Inside Europe comes to you from DW in Germany. <laughs>